Hello, everyone. I should start by pointing out that it's such a special honor, but also such a huge responsibility to be invited to contribute a lecture for this master's class. A special thank you to the Critical Internationalization Studies Network team for putting together this much needed class and to the Spencer Foundation for supporting the project. In this lecture, we'll think together about how global South-South relations may shape internationalization efforts in higher education institutions. The focus on global South-South relations is important because there is a widespread perception that higher education internationalization is a highly beneficial endeavor. This perception, however, tends to disregard how internationalization often perpetuates inequalities but also the persistence of colonial patterns in global South institutions. The goal of this lecture then is to highlight the tensions, the complexities, and the generative possibilities of higher education internationalization in the global South context. It is my hope that the lecture will challenge each one of us to think critically about potential responses to at least um, two important questions. The first question is, how can internationalization efforts meet the social, epistemic, economic, relational, and racial justice demands in formerly colonized regions of the world? And the second question is, what can international education learn from calls for decolonization and from regional perspectives, narratives, and cosmologies such as the Ubuntu, philo the Ubuntu philosophy? Before we go on, let me share a little bit about myself and about my work, both of which have a bearing on what we are going to cover in the lecture. My academic training has been at the intersection of three fields. The first one is higher education policy studies with a focus on comparative and international education. The second is international development studies. And the third is African studies. For my dissertation project, I studied conflicting policy imperatives to expand, to equalize, and to internationalize higher education opportunities in post-apartheid South Africa, shown here on the map in orange. I also highlighted the country in green on the map because this is home for me. I would be curious to see if you can identify the name of that country at first glance. Currently, I'm a project manager for Ubuntu Dialogues, and I'm also the faculty lead for the Reeves Scholars Program at Michigan State University, or MSU. Ubuntu Dialogues is a partnership between the MSU African Studies Center and the Stellenbosch University Museum at Stellenbosch University in Cape Town, South Africa. And this project is funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. For those who might not be familiar with the word, Ubuntu is an African sociocentric philosophy premised on collective humanity and interdependence. The Ubuntu Dialogues project places these notions of collective humanity and interdependence at the center of efforts to build bridges across difference and to decolonize knowledge and institutions. I will circle back to the notion of Ubuntu towards the end of the lecture. My other portfolio at MSU is with the Reeves Scholars Program, a reciprocal exchange between future teachers at MSU and at the University of the Cape Coast in Ghana. I am also co-founder of Decoloniality Dialogues, an interdisciplinary and transnational group of graduate students, early career faculty, independent researchers and practitioners. And we all connect around a shared commitment and engagement with decolonial theory and practice. Based on these scholarly interests and engagements, and on my lived and work experiences, I propose that we take the African continent, in particular Southern Africa, as our case study for exploring the shape and the form that internationalization takes in global South contexts. It might be best if I take a few minutes to situate this discussion within the scope of what has become an imperative to internationalize higher education. Higher education internationalization scholars, 
have suggested and have argued that the intensification of globalization over the last few decades has created a seeming but also an inescapable imperative to internationalize universities around the world. In other words, universities have sought to respond to, cope with, and reap the benefits of the global academic environment by internationalizing their student and faculty bodies, their research and teaching functions, their policies and practices, and their administrative processes. Global South scholars, such as Maringe and Foskett, recognize the same, that higher education has tended to internationalization as both a response and as a proactive way of meeting the demands of greater globalization, both in the immediate and also as preparation for envisaged futures. However, the imperatives to internationalize, especially in the 21st century knowledge economy, comes packaged with neoliberal logics that require universities to compete in a global higher education market. And that's what we read from some of the internationalization scholars. The worldwide ascendance and dominance of neoliberalism has redefined higher education in market terms, such that there has been a growing influence of labor markets on internationalization. And um, I will provide a list of the citations that I'm using for this part of the presentations, uh, if this is required or needed. We should note that this pressure to enter the competitive global marketplace has coincided with declining public funding for higher education. One question that arises then is, what happens when universities are compelled to join the marketplace in these logics? According to Stromquist 2007, greater salience is given to those fields that can be directly linked to the growth of revenues, while the rest of courses and programs risk disappearing. In addition, university rankings receive top priority. Students are configured as customers and the sense of common purpose that traditionally united different disciplines decreases. Ultimately, academic programs are structured to promote students' economic potential rather than their intellectual growth. These adverse effects are even more acute in global South contexts, especially so in African countries, where the higher education sector is critically crippled by colonial legacies and the underfunding of structural adjustment programs. As I am sure we all know, ideas about the status, the reputation, the quality, and the competitiveness of higher education institutions have been drastically shaped by university rankings. Hazelcon 2014, for example, notes that despite criticism and some boycotts by higher education institutions, the rankings have, been, have become a game changer for higher education and research, intensifying cross-national comparisons of performance and productivity. It is not surprising that these rankings feed into the inequalities inherent in both globalization processes and the internationalization capabilities among nations. As Forstop 28, 2008 points out, the interrelatedness between globalization and internationalization serves to maintain long-standing global hierarchies of flaws of knowledges and power and people. It is both remarkable and deeply concerning that dominant narrative, narratives rationalize internationalization celebrate its virtues and offer toolkits of best practices for countries and higher education institutions and systems. As I will argue in this lecture, current internationalization debates in global South contexts mainly revolve around legitimizing universalizing concepts and approaches that are emanating from the experiences of countries in the global North. In other words, global North imaginaries dictate the terms and contours of internationalization in ways that privilege depoliticized understandings of policy frameworks and practices in the global south. Let me bring you to South Africa to look at how the country's public universities are responding to 
and operating in the globally competitive academic environment. Rather than speak in general terms, how about if I take a few moments to take you into one formerly white university, which was the main site for my dissertation fieldwork in 2015 and 2016. This university openly embraces an international recognition logic and it aspires to earn a place among the top 100 universities in the world. The pressure to benchmark against international norms, standards and best practices pushes the university administrators to attract and to strategically recruit international graduate students and faculty members and to increase their research outputs in financial health. The university actively seeks to expand the promotion of the proportion of graduate students, which was at 33% at the time of my study, but they wanted to push it up to 50% of total enrollment. Aside from graduate students, the university also sought to increase the proportion of non-national students to about 30% of total enrollment. As you can see from this graph, which, feature, which features select South African universities, the proportion of non-national students is exceptionally high. To put the numbers into perspective, on average, the proportion of non-national students in the US is around 3% of the total student body. Why does this university, but also other South African universities, why do they care about increasing the proportion of graduate and non-national students? This is because it would enable the universities to generate the research outputs that are valued in global university ranking systems. In universities across the country, non-national students offer one of the best opportunities to raise and to attain international profile. This is because the legacy of the apartheid in South Africa leave many black South Africans struggling to succeed in college owing to poor K-12 educational experiences in under-resourced rural and township schools. Non-national students are often perceived as more adequately prepared to succeed, to graduate on time, and to pursue graduate studies than Black South African students who have high dropout rates and face pressures to go work soon after their undergraduate degrees. An internationalization-oriented admission agenda of this nature directly contradicts a national reform agenda that emphasizes locally driven post-apartheid concerns, such as redress, racial justice, democratization, reconstruction, and equity. The national level equity imperative is a response to, a, to several related factors, including the denigration, the marginalization, and the subjugation that the Black South African majority suffered at the hands of a white minority during apartheid. The other one is the persistence of racially divisive and exclusionary policies in the post-apartheid era. This is what led to the student protests that broke out at South African public universities in 2015 and 2016, which came to be widely known as the roads must fall and fees must fall movements. The protests were framed around several demands, including number one, to bring the racial distribution of students and faculty members to mirror the country's racial black majority demographics. Number two, to replace the existing Eurocentric curriculum with an Africanized curriculum. And number three, to make the institutional culture responsive to the academic and other needs of black South Africans. There is an important dimension of the tension between the international recognition and national racial justice imperatives that I would like to draw attention to. The internationalization discourse in South Africa is built on historical inequalities linked to the country's racial segregation in the education system that existed during apartheid. While the country's historically black universities might embrace and use the international recognition rhetoric, they are not really trying to position themselves as world-class sites for higher education. Neither can they, because limited resources severely constrain their ability to attract the best students and the best faculty members, or to generate significant quantities of internationally recognized research. Thus, the pressure to internationalize is uniquely acute 
at historically white universities. And these same universities are at the center of battles for institutional and knowledge decolonization. We have looked briefly at how South African universities embrace the international recognition logic and the desire to integrate within a competitive global intellectual economy. We also noted that this focus on global competition excludes and alienates historically marginalized Black South Africans. The global and the national are not the only policy imperatives though. And especially if we think about what the conflicts over the missions and daily functioning of public universities in the global South. South Africa in particular has to deal with the complexities related to the country's place and its role in a regional com context. By regional context here, I mean the Southern African Development Community or SADC, a grouping of 15 countries, which are shown here on the map in blue. The end of apartheid in 1994 has seen South Africa emerge as the most coveted study destination in Africa, ranking number 11 in the world as a destination for non-national students. This is because the country has the most developed higher education system on the continent, with some of the top rated and internationally renowned universities, such as um, the University of Cape Town, Stellenbosch University, the University of Pretoria, and the University of the Witwatersrand. Non-nationals from immediate Sadak region they have been forced to seek study opportunities in South Africa due to endemic economic challenges, but also political instabilities and limited higher education opportunities in their countries. The students realize that South African degrees carry international currents that makes them a different and a better kind of investment than a degree from their home countries. According to the Department of Higher Education and Training, out of the total student population enrolled in the public higher education institutions in 2017, 7.5% were non-national students. Of these non-national students, 73% were from other SADC countries, 16% from other African countries, and 9% from the rest of the world. This is unlike the US, for example, where the foreign student population constitute about 3%, and we have talked about this already, of the student population. And most of them do not come from neighboring countries. And by this, I mean, so Mexico might be the source country for most labor migrants in the US, but Mexico is not the major source country for international students. But this is the inverse in South Africa because the neighboring countries provide the source, um, they are the source countries for both labor migration, but also for education migration. Despite the visible presence of non-national regional students, South Africa's post-1994 higher education policy has mainly revolved around what Jensen refers to as the logic of resolving the racist apar apartheid legacy and the logic of incorporating the higher education system within the context of a competitive globalized economy. In my work, I emphasize the need to recognize the limitations of local, global, and other dichotomies in analyzing regionally interconnected structures and relations. In other words, in addition to the global competition and the national racial justice imperatives, the South African higher education sector has to attend to development cooperation pressures within the region. The regional context is particularly important because South Africa's history and its future, they remain closely bound up with those of its neighbors in the Sadak region. These ties have to do with the roles that Sadak countries played in supplying migrant labor for South African mines, in supporting the struggle against apartheid and as key investment destinations for South African capital. In terms of labor migration, Workers from the Southern African region served as key labor resources. Um, they, they were the, most of the workers working in South African mines had their origin within the Sadak region. 
South Africa's workforce has always comprised a significant number of migrants from Lesotho, from Mozambique, from Zambia, from Zimbabwe, and other countries in Southern Africa. This does not discount the construction of a vast recruiting apparatus to sweep through the South African rural countryside for labor and for efficiently delivering it to the mines. But uh, scholars like Krash and Chitereke argue that without access to labor from neighboring countries, the South African gold mines would have shut down. As an example, the 1970 census for Lesotho, a country that is entirely surrounded by South Africa, shows that more than 80% of men aged between 18 and 35 were employed in South African mines. The proportion was 50% for Botswana and 15% for Mozambique. Aside from labor migration, SADC countries bore the brand of the apartheid regime's destabilization campaign because of their role in supporting the anti-apartheid struggle. The military campaign was launched to destroy the African National Congress bases in these countries and to prevent the ANC-aligned guerrillas from undertaking operations to end apartheid. By ANC here, or African National Congress, this is the political party that we know Nelson Mandela of. Nelson Mandela is the popular leader of post-apartheid in the apartheid struggle, but also in post-apartheid South Africa. So the political party he led was the African National Congress. So this party set up bases in neighboring countries and the apartheid regime would go in and try to flush them out. It is estimated that the destabilization campaign cost the region more than 60 billion US dollars in destroyed infrastructure and lack of development opportunities. So people who write about this argue that the destabilization campaign stands as one of the less acknowledged crimes of the 20th century. Despite the costs of the destruction, SADC countries welcomed South African nationals and they showed that the responsibility to educate and train them, um, and especially the professionals who are currently the mainstay of the South African economy. The third factor pertains to South Africa's sprawling business interests and expansive investments across the region. South Africa has actively encouraged regional expansion by its companies throughout the state-owned Industrial Development Corporation, which has invested in 60 projects in 21 different countries, according to Kamodi 2012. As a result, South African corporations have established themselves through the purchase of privatized assets and outright displacement of local businesses in neighboring states. For this reason, one of my research participants spoke pointedly about the need for South Africans to realize that they do, not have, they do have certain kinds of moral debt toward the rest of the continent. While this participant in my research did not advocate for a tit for tat accounting of how much each African country paid in various forms of help to the ANC, he sees South Africa's business interest in the region as cause for advancing a regional solidarity cause. This relationship with the SADC region means that it would be misleading for either South Africa and here public universities to be talked about in just national and global terms, or for the SADC students to be designated as international or foreign students. The historical ties between South Africa and her neighbors means that SADAC students have different relationships with the South African state and they have different needs from the country's universities. As Ferguson 2006 points out, constructions of the local and the so-called national economies in Southern Africa do not exist separately from an encompassing set of regional relations. Writing on the politics of nation state legitimacy, Ferguson questions the tendency to theorize the world as an assemblage of national economies. He argues that the logic of the international order of states is to segment off exploited, impoverished, and unstable regions within discrete national compartments. These compartments mask the relations that link the rich and the poor regions behind false fronts of a sovereignty and independence that have never existed. For instance, Ferguson questions the idea that Lesotho, a small, in, a small dependent labor reserve for South Africa, could be analyzed as a national economy. He argues that 
the uncontested construction of Lesotho as a sovereign nation state is responsible for localizing responsibility for poverty within national borders while obscuring regional connections. If the past, the present, and the future of Southern countries are intertwined, what does it mean that the countries in Southern Africa are constituted as separate nation states? Citing the limitations of the nation state as a framework for understanding how the world is organized and how it functions, Darian Smith and McCarthy 2017 propose a transgressive and an integrative global studies approach. The transgressive notion denotes breaking down spatial boundaries in the sense of transgressing north-south, south-south, southeast boundaries. The integrative notion offers a way of teasing out the synergies, the connections, and the networks of what are often thought of as discrete social, political, and economic processes. This model provides for a more distributed, decentralized, and deterritorialized understanding of overlapping and mutually constitutive geographical and conceptual sites and arenas. Far from being a series of spatial containers vertically nested from the local through the national up to the global, these levels, sites, and arenas are better understood as embedded sets of inseparable relations that are continually creating and recreating each other. I bring the critical global studies approach to problematize the construction of South Africa's place in the world in strictly global and national terms. This global national binary operationalizes notions of national belonging that preclude SADAC students from holding any claims to South African higher education and other opportunities and rights that are designated for national students. An example is certain scholarships, but also political activism. Constructions of citizenship are obviously contested and the contestations get at the heart of what is understood as public and which understandings should be privileged above others. I would like to turn now to the SADAC subsidy. An example of a regional higher education policy that gestures toward a moral argument to redistribute goods and resources in recognition of the long and complicated history of South Africa's engagement with their neighbors in the con on the continent. The SADAC subsidy is a key part of the SADAC protocol on education and training. It was signed by head of states and government in 1997, and it seeks to establish a legal and institutional framework to promote regional integration in specific priority areas of education training, research, and development. It is an acknowledgement of the need to think and to act collectively to develop the human resource capacity of the region. The protocol was envisaged as a means to overcome the disadvantages that are faced by individual states in their attempt to build successful education systems. And this is from Watson 2009. One of the articles of the protocol stipulates that students from and studying in another southern country shall be treated as home students for purposes of fees and accommodation. Looking at the graph, the blue line is the full cost of study. The green line is what the student would actually pay. And the difference is the subsidy, whose beneficiaries are South African students and SADAC students. Just as a reminder, South Africa is the most popular study destination for the bulk of education migrants within the SADAC region. Also, upwards of 70% of the non-national students in South African universities are from SADAC countries. As one research participant noted during my field work, for South Africa, the SADAC subsidy is premised on both moral and utilitarian arguments. The moral argument gets at what the state can do for instance, through expanding access to higher education to redistribute goods and resources in ways that compensate for historical injustices. Mobilizing the moral care argument as in making higher education a reparation resource raises an important question. What is the extent to which that which can be paid for with money 
both internally in South Africa and regionally, can actually address the historical injustices in an equitable manner. While free education could be provided to South African citizens and subsidized education to SADAC students, the majority of people could still say the moral debt has not been paid. Why is that? Because the proportion of the Black South African and SADAC population that get admission into South Africa's top-rated universities is remarkably small compared to the population that does not benefit therefrom. The utilitarian argument, on the other hand, recognizes the instrumental role that SADAC students play in holding together and in mediating the tension between internationalization imperatives and demands for national racial justice. Being both non-national and almost all black, the SADAC students make South African universities appear more racially integrated and more internationalized. In other words, their presence on campuses increase the number of black students South African universities can claim to be educating. These students also help the country's universities improve key quality indicators such as earning better grades and high on-time graduation rates. In reality, the SADAC students are mainly invisible and not fully accounted for in formal institutional discourses, policies and structures for either internationalization or national racial justice. This is because collectively, these regional students are not the typical self-funding international customer that major destination countries such as the US and Australia rely on for much needed source of income. They are actually subsidized by the host country as we have just talked about. At the same time, they are not the historically marginalized black South Africans targeted by and benefiting from the South African government's post-apartheid equity policies. The instrumental role that SADAC students are made to play while denying them the full rights of South African nationals represents a failure on the part of the South African state and universities to recognize in more substantive ways the SADAC region's shared history and shared future. This failure is evident in the limited institutional policy attention given to SADAC students, their negative experiences with administration and as victims of xenophobia, a subject that I and other people address elsewhere. This is part of why Darian Smith and McCarthy 2017 argue for approaches that reach beyond nationalism to embrace the wider humanity. These approaches can help us think seriously about the possibilities of global citizenship and the potential they hold for transforming our understanding of individuals' roles in society and our collective place in the world. I don't have time in this lecture to discuss the concept and practice of Ubuntu at length, but I would like to offer that as one of the humane ways to question how we make sense of each other as people. As I mentioned earlier on, Ubuntu is an African sociocentric philosophy premised on interdependence and collective humanity. As a moral ethic, it has organic linkages with the African worldview and essence of being and is rooted in reciprocity, empathy and connectedness. How can an emphasis on these key tenets of Ubuntu be utilized to rethink internationalization in the global South and around the world? Ubuntu challenges us to revisit how we define ourselves individually as human beings and how we relate to others as human. In other words, how do we humanize ourselves and how do we humanize other people? It provides a critical lens for re-evaluating our relationships with education systems and how we might live together in a way that says we share humanity, we have our shared humanity. This is especially needed now when migration for education, for climate change, for work opportunities and for survival is increasing across the SADAC region, on the continent and across the world. Ubuntu eliminates what decolonial scholars such as Yovu Gacheni call the common colonial fiction that humans have inherent differences that can be separated into different groups based on geography, culture and society. 
If this notion of Ubuntu is new to you, I encourage you to check it out and to reflect on how it can be applied to higher education, internationalization, scholarship, policies, and practices. In conclusion, I would like to take you back to the two questions I posed at the beginning. How can internationalization efforts meet social, epistemic, economic, relational, and racial justice demands in formerly colonized regions of the world? What can international education learn from calls for decolonization and from regional perspectives, narratives, and cosmologies such as Ubuntu philosophy? No one person or one study can provide adequate answers to these questions. What I have tried to do in this lecture is to present some of the contradictions and tensions that arise for global South countries with long histories of deeply racist colonial relations. South Africa, for example, is to determine how to integrate national demands for racial justice, intra-regional demands for development cooperation, and the internationalization goals of their higher education systems. These tensions and universities' response to them have implications for thinking about the place of the university in societies and to whom they belong. Is a university an apparatus of state power? Is it an organization for students? And which students? Is it as universal as its name implies, or does it belong unto itself? I would be very delighted to hear your thoughts and to think together further about any questions you might have. And so I would like to invite you to get in touch. <laughs>